the Canon EOS R1 is the most anticipated camera, I would say, of the last 10 years. And I know this because every time I put out a video, the R1 just lights up analytics. It gets more views than the R5 did. It gets more reviews than the R3, the Alpha 1, the Z9, and the recently announced GH6 and OM1. There's an awful lot of people that are really excited by this camera. It is going to be a successor to the 1DX Mark III. There are going to be no more DSLRs in the 1 series, so the R1 replaces that, and it makes sense it's going to be called the R1 because the 1DX is a 1 series camera, so it's going to be called the R1. We know very little in terms of leaked specifications, but Canon Rumors several months ago put out this quote, coming from one of their sources saying that the R1 will be a jack of all trades and a master of none, except that it will be a master of everything. And that's a pretty bold statement. Now, normally with the 1 Series camera, it's very, very simple to figure out what it's going to be, especially if a 5 Series camera was released, well, relatively recently. And we did that with the R5. We also got the R3. So here's what normally happens with the R or the 1 Series. We're going to call this the R1. So what we expect with the R1 is that the video specs are going to be well, better than everything else below it. So better than the R5, better than the R3, and most likely better than the R5C. And stills capabilities? Well, again, the R1 is going to be better than everything else below it. So it's usually very easy to do that. And if we look at the 1DX Mark II and we compare it to the 5D Mark IV, and we keep going back in time, that was always the case. Now, sometimes the video capabilities of the 1 series were only just a hairline better than what was in the 5 series. But this time around, things are very different. We're doing a complete architecture shift, moving away from DSLRs to mirrorless. Canon's released about five cameras already, the EOS R and the RP, which were more or less their way of saying, hey, look, we're serious about mirrorless. But it wasn't until we got the R5 and the R6 that we could really see what Canon was capable of. 8K RAW at up to 30 frames per second. And yes, there was overheat. And yes, there's 30-minute record limits. 30-minute record limits. Now, the R3 has shown us that Canon can really uh, lift those limits. No overheating, no record limits, doing 6K RAW up to 60 frames per second. Another thing we need to look at, too, is look at the Alpha 1, 50 megapixels, and it can do up to 30 frames per second. Look at the Nikon, look at the Nikon Z9. It can do up to 30 frames per second with a 45.7 megapixel sensor. It is a very, very powerful camera. And as far as video goes, it's going to be able to do up to 8K at 60 frames per second in a future firmware update in Apple ProRes 422. And that's a really big deal. So not only are we going to look at the R1 from the point of view of all the cameras re released beneath it, but Canon's not going to look at Nikon and Sony and say, hey, you know what, they're doing their own thing, that's great, they can do 50 megapixels, they can do 45 megapixels, we're just going to do our own thing. No, you see, Canon perceives itself as being the king of the hill. They're the top dog, and anybody else that challenges them, well, like a cat on top of a hill, will get swatted. So I don't believe they're going to leave the Nikon Z9 unnoticed. Same with the Alpha 1. So for the rest of this video, I'm going to look at the stills capabilities, and I'm going to look at the video capabilities and what I expect the R1 to have at a bare minimum when we look at everything in Canon's lineup right now. And if we look at everything that is out there from Sony in their Alpha 1 and Nikon in their Z9. The first thing that most people wonder is, okay, what kind of sensor is it going to have? What kind of processor? And the R1 is going to have a new processor, and it's going to have a new sensor. And I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that the R1 is going to have a backside illuminated stack sensor. Sony's been doing it for a long time. Nikon did it. And of course, we have it in the R3. So what a stack sensor does, or a BSI stack sensor does, is it allows it to process information a whole lot faster, and it allows it to improve dynamic range in low light situations. So there's so many benefits to going with a BSI stack sensor, and this being a flagship camera, they're definitely going to do it. They're 100%. The R3 has it. They're not going to come out with a camera that sells for more than this, and then say, yeah, no, we're just going to go with a, a traditional architecture. No, so it's going to be a BSI stack sensor. The next thing is, what about megapixels? Well, Sony has 50 megapixels, Nikon has 45.7 megapixels, Canon already has a 45 megapixel sensor that they put in the R5 and the R5C. But I think what Canon is going to do is they're going to want to one-up the competition, and I think they can push 55 or even 60 megapixels on this camera. I don't think they're going to push too high because they still want to be able to achieve that 30 frames per second. And I'm not talking about 30 frames per second JPEG. 
I'm not talking about 30 frames per second with some sort of lossy type compression or raw. And yes, if it's raw, it shouldn't be lossy, right? But, but the point I'm trying to get to is I believe that it's going to be able to do 30 frames per second lossless. And that's going to push an incredible amount of data, definitely more than 1.2 gigabytes per second, and most likely approaching somewhere around 1.5 gigabytes per second. And it's going to have dual CF Express cards to handle this. And yes, CF Express cards right now can receive a huge amount of data. Angelbird with her AV Pro line has cards, a 660 gigabyte card that can actually achieve a minimum sustained write speed of 1,480 megabytes per second. So 55 to 60 megapixels, uh, 30 frames per second, lossless burst. I, I think that's highly, it makes an awful lot of sense. We're also gonna get more dynamic range. I would probably push around 15 stops of dynamic range, but at the very minimum, 14 plus stops of dynamic range. And ISO performance will be better. Well, I'll say the low light performance will be better because we can we can go ahead and say ISO 50 to 102,000, 204,000, or 1.6 million as one site room at the R1 would have. But at the end of the day, these are just numbers. What we expect to see is better low light performance, and that's going to carry over to stills as well as video. Now, shutter speed, we're probably going to see a shutter speed of at least 1 64 thousandths of a second. But the R3 has it, so why not the R1? But I don't believe we're going to see a mechanical shutter. Nikon came out with their Z9 and showed the world that you don't need a mechanical shutter and you can shoot without a rolling shutter. So I expect the R1 to do away with it as well. It helps keep costs down. And as you're going to see later on, cost is going to play a huge part in this camera. Now, other specifications. Quad pixel autofocus. Um, sure, I, I don't see why not. I really don't care what it has inside. Now, quad pixel autofocus does allow it to be more accurate and reliable, especially if you're rotating the camera from different viewpoints. And they won't be the first to market with quad pixel autofocus. That OM1 by OM Systems, Olympus, yeah, it has quad pixel autofocus. So it's out there already. I don't see a problem with having it. But what I'm more curious about is the different autofocus modes. I would like to say that the R1 is going to be at least as good as the Z9 and the OM1 in terms of the different types of objects it can track. So trains, planes, automobiles, and yes, a whole range of different trains, planes, and automobiles. I autofocus for humans as well as the rest of the animal kingdom, including pets, animals, and also torso and head detection too. So it's always going to be able to maintain a lock of focus on the individual. But I think as far as the software that comes into play, the autofocus is going to act a little differently too. It's going to notice not just the eye of one person, but all the different subjects, allowing you to easily switch between them, which is really, really helpful, especially if you're shooting video, if you want to transition from one to another, giving us more controls over the autofocus system. So I definitely think it's going to be more accurate, and I think it's going to cover more things. And who knows, maybe, just maybe, they'll also provide us with boat and UFO autofocus as well. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding there a little bit. Now, in terms of the EVF, Sony has the highest resolution EVF. It's 9.44 million dots. I think Canon's right now around 5, 5.7 million dots. And to me, that's a pretty, pretty good resolution. Yes, there's room to go. They could go 10 million. But I think what really matters with an EVF is that refresh rate. So when you're moving around, it doesn't, you don't have any of that ghosting. It's just like you're looking through a regular viewfinder. And if they can do that, that's going to be a huge win. The viewfinder on the R5, I love it, especially when I'm previewing stuff outside because I don't have to worry about the light hitting the LCD, and that's a big problem because you just can't see it very well. But when you're looking through the EVF, wow, uh, the detail is really good. You can see everything clearly. So I definitely think there's room for improvement with the EVF as well. And as far as the EVS sensitivity, I believe it'll be capable of at least minus 8 up to 20 EV for the autofocus system. And as far as the stills go on this camera, really, really powerful. And just simple things such as a BSI stack center is huge. Being able to give us 55 or 60 megapixels. I mean, this is becoming a high megapixel camera in its own right. And to be able to shoot 30 frames per second, this will definitely be a master of everything when it comes to stills. And one, one thing Canon does well is they're still a photographer's company. Most of the organization is still focused on stills and everything they do in these cameras is all about photographers. Yes, they do have a strong video side, but you'd be surprised in the organization, they're always butting heads, the video guys against the photo guys, because 
at the nature of the organization, very traditional, it's still a very, very, very photocentric company. But they're slowly coming over to the video side. The R5C is really what should have happened with the R5. We shouldn't have had the overheat like we did, and we shouldn't have record limits in any of the Canon cameras. But now, let's take a look at video. Having a BSI stack sensor is really good news for video as well. And as far as the megapixel size of 55 or 60 megapixels, well, it allows many different options. It allows Canon to put in something higher than 8K. Now, we don't know if they're going to go 9.2K over sampled 8K. We don't even know if they're going to push the sensor to be able to shoot 12K. I mean, this is possible. But I think what Canon can do to beat the Nikon Z9, the Sony Alpha 1, and pretty well every other stills hybrid camera out there is not necessarily push above 8K, but give us more detailed 8K. So for example, full sensor readout giving us anything north of 8, so 8.6K oversampled is possible the Alpha 1 with a 50 megapixel sensor. If they go 55 or even 60, that will allow up to 9.2K oversampled 8K, giving us more detail. But I think what they could really do to capture the attention is provide 8K at 120 frames per second, and that's in the category of the Red V Raptor. Now, me as a filmmaker, the 120 frames per second in 8K isn't necessarily as important as being able to provide more detailed 8K video. I don't shoot 8K all the time, but all the videos I shoot, including this one here, are 8K oversampled 4K, giving me a lot of detail in 4K. For what I shoot, that's important. But the other thing I want too, when I do shoot 8K, it's because I'm doing product review videos. So whether it's something as simple as a battery, I, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit. Instead of using a motorized slider, I shoot those video segments in 8K. And so in post using a Ken Burns effect, it allows me to simulate the effects of a motorized slider. And I really love that flexibility because sometimes when I set up the slider, I don't set it up correctly. I've got to change things around. Well, in post, it's one of those few things that's easier to do. All I have to do is adjust the start and end on a Ken Burns effect, and I've created the effect that I want. But having that detail is very essential because when you're looking at 8K and you downsample to 4K is one thing, but as you start to punch into that 8K footage, that's when you can see the softness. So while I'm not producing 8K videos, I'm using 8K as a master file where I want to maintain that detail. And I can punch in sometimes well below 4K, almost to 2K, and it still looks absolutely amazing. So again, that BSI stack sensor can really, really help here, providing that high detailed 8K, 8K raw video. But I also want to see 4K raw as well. And yes, there is a way to do this. And yes, technically it's not 100% raw, but what we want with RAW is the ability in post to change some of the characteristics that we can't once we've already shot. That's why I, when I shoot stills, I always shoot RAW plus JPEG. I generally go with the JPEG unless it doesn't look that great. Then I go into the efforts of editing the RAW and using Canon software. Wow, it's just amazing. It's like I'm right there back shooting the still again and I'm able to adjust everything. It's just really terrific. But also the ability to shoot in full HD or 1920 by 200. Right now, Canon caps that out at 120 frames per second on their stills hybrid line, but we know they can go higher. They've got the technology to do so. They do in, in the cinema line. I think what we could see in the R1 is the ability to shoot 180, 200, and 240 frames per second. Now, the varying degree of sharpness will change, obviously, but I think that would be really, really huge. Now, in terms of 4K, will we shoot past 120 frames per second. Well, it's certainly possible, but I would think we could go to 150 or 180. I don't see anything like 200 or 240. But again, if we look at everything out in the market, if it wants to be the master of everything, they want to bump up the specs just a little bit, but while providing really good detail, maintaining those colors, maintaining the quality that people expect from Canon. Of course, low light and dynamic range will be improved, and I expect to see something around, the, around 14 plus stops of dynamic range. Certainly 15 or 16 would be really, really good. But at some point, we're going to have to talk about that Cripple Hammer. And I'll do that after we cover all the video specifications. Because even though this is their flagship camera, they're not going to want to sell you a camera for, well, $6,400 to $10,000. That's going to cannibalize their cinema line. So that's where we're going to start to talk about the Cripple Hammer there. It's going to definitely have dual CF Express cards, and that's going to be very, very important for dual video recording and also being able to record for a whole lot longer. 
We currently have four terabyte CF Express cards on the market. They're available for pre-order, but not available for sale at this point. But given about another week, and yes, they'll be available for sale from Angelbird. With two slots, that gives you eight terabytes of video recording. So even if you're recording 8K RAW at even up to 120 frames per second, you're gonna record for a good long time. And that's really, really big. But these cameras will also have to support a different file allocation table or different uh, master boot record. They're going to need to be able to support GPT or GUID, and that will support uh, CF Express cards much larger than even four terabytes. And uh, well, I wouldn't say the sky is the limit because the larger we go, the more chips we put onto a uh, CF Express card, that's another source of heat. But I still believe that the R1 isn't going to overheat in any way whatsoever. Now, we see this with the R3, so we know Canon can do it. And I believe the R1 is going to be a slightly bigger body. But no overheating, no record limits, definitely not in 6K up to 60, probably not in 8K up to 30 frames per second. Now, as we get up to 60 or 120 frames per second, it's really hard to say. Currently, we're looking at about 325 megabytes per second for 8K RAW, 30 frames per second, and 60 frames per second on the Canon EOS R5, the R5C, and the R3 with its 6K60. But if we start to push up to 120 frames per second, Canon's pretty much going to have to double that at about 660 to about 750 frames per second, depending on what RAW, um, whether we're, you, there's three different RAWs that they have applied to the R5C. So at the very high end, you're probably looking at so 325, 650, probably around 650 megabytes per second. Um, but some of the lighter ones, you can probably drop that down quite a bit. And that's what I would also expect to see in this camera too. Not just the raw, but different types of raw uh, compression algorithms to help us with storage and of just moving contents off the, um, the, the, the cards. But something else that's very, very important too, because a lot of these newer CF Express cards are so fast that you can edit right off and you can take them out of the camera and start editing the video. And that's really huge. But and this is a big but. It needs to be able to offer something like, like Apple ProRes 422 or 422 HQ. Now, Nikon is going to be offering Apple ProRes in a future firmware update. And I can't remember if it's Apple ProRes 422, Apple ProRes 422 HQ, or even Apple ProRes RAW. And what I could see Canon doing, if they do do this, they'll offer anywhere from Apple ProRes 422 up to Apple ProRes RAW. And I think that's very, very important. Canon can't let the Nikon Z9 go unnoticed. Uh, the Nikon Z9 is a very, very powerful camera. It's truly incredible. And when I see people knocking it, it's just like, hold on a minute here. Look at this camera and what it's capable of doing. It is truly impressive. And Canon's got to look at this and say, you know, do we keep doing it the Canon way? Do we ignore Apple ProRes 422 for another year? And Nikon isn't the only camera to do this. The GH6, which is much cheaper, is doing Apple ProRes 422 and Apple ProRes 422 HQ. I think that there's a very strong capability we could see this codec, but I know what you're thinking. Wouldn't they have put it in the R5C? And yeah, I would think they would, but maybe it's that cripple hammer coming back again and saying, okay, no Apple ProRes for you, R5, but if you want to buy the R1, we'll give you Apple ProRes 422. Again, we'll just have to wait and see. Other, so other modes, Apple or sorry, no, Apple, uh, 8K RAW for sure, 4K RAW most likely, uh, but what I'd like to see for... FHD is the ability to do oversampled 1080, to give people that really sharp 1080, because a lot of people who are going to be buying the R1 are still primarily photographers, but they also want to capture video. And for most of them, 1080 is all they deliver their client. They don't want to have to shoot in 4K unless, of course, the detail isn't there in 1080. But if you give the pros oversampled 1080, they'll shoot in 1080. That's all they need, smaller file sizes, and it's going to make them very, very happy. Other modes we're expected to see, well, Super 35 modes and also Canon Log 3 and 2. Sounds like a pretty powerful camera, doesn't it? And if that statement earlier from Canon Rumors is correct, a jack of all trades, a master of none, except that it will be a master of everything. And that is really bold, and that's, in a way, a little bit arrogant. But that's what we'd expect from Canon, a company that's been sitting on Top of the marketplace for the last, what, how many years? And, well, yes, I agree. Sony is top of the hill when it comes to mirrorless cameras and when it comes into 
other categories too, but really right now, when you look at all interchangeable lens cameras, DSLRs and mirrorless, which there's still a ton of mirrorless cameras being sold and shipped, Canon is clearly in first place with something like 45.7% of the market or 47.9% of the market with Sony and Nikon in a distant second place. So when you're there for that long and you've been doing cameras for that long, there's not, it's not surprising that they, there's a sense of arrogance that we are the best and nobody can do it better than us. And until they came up with the R5, I, I thought that arrogance was a little bit misplaced. I looked at the EOS R and I thought, wow, what a huge letdown. When that camera was announced, I was really excited because I was looking at maybe upgrading my 70D, this camera right back here. But when I saw the specifications, I thought, just looking at the competition from Sony, it was a huge letdown. It was, this is the best you can do. It was more or less using a lot of the same innards borrowed from the 5D Mark IV in a mirrorless version. Yes, some things it didn't do nearly as well, like frame rates, but other things, compare them side by side, and they were very, very similar. Although, yes, the price point was significantly less. But when Canon came out with the R5, they proved to a lot of us, whether we were customers or not, that Canon does have the technology, the skills, and the foresight, the strategic vision to be able to produce really, really solid cameras. And it doesn't even take much to produce an R1 from the R5. All they have to do is put it in a bigger body, better thermals, 8K 60 frames per second, uh, faster refresh rate, faster buffer, and they've already got a solid R1 camera. It, they don't have to do much. But I don't think Canon's happy enough with just producing a camera that beats the R5 and the R3. I really do think that the Alpha 1 and the Nikon Z9 are really going to help shape the R1. And Canon's had time. They're not rushing to get out with this one here, which is really interesting. They're not taking the jabs from Sony and Nikon. They're taking their time and they're developing this camera. It's really hard to peg where the cripple hammer is going to attack the R1. I mean, at this point, we don't know the specifications of this camera. Everything I've talked about is based on analysis, looking at the 1 Series camera, comparing it to the 5 Series camera, which is ca what Canon has always done. And then that 1 Series will always be slightly better than the 5 Series in every way from photo and still, sorry, or photo and video. But Canon's also going to look at the Sony Alpha 1 and the Z9. But outside of that, we know that the Cripple Hammer is going to strike. Now, obviously, Canon is going to segment this camera from the cinema line, and not having internal ND filters or an SDI out to me isn't it isn't a cripple hammer. It's just they're different lines, but where else could we see it? Could they put time limits in? Well, I think it's certainly possible. They could do 8K at an hour. They could do 8K at six hours. Like the R3 has a six-hour limit on 6K60. I don't know why. Now, the GH6 uh, can shoot up to seven hours, um, and Gordon Lang did this test. He shot up to seven hours, seven hours and 20 minutes, and then it stopped recording. I think it was something to do with some of his settings, he probably could have gone higher. And even me, if I was doing a test, I'd probably stop at two or three hours because anything after that is just, you're not going to record continuously for that long on a camera. But other areas where the cripple hammer could creep in, really hard to say. I could certainly see them segmenting the different video modes. I could see them giving us 8K raw and then not giving us 4K raw and definitely not giving us oversampled um, FHD or 2K, not oversampled 4K. Uh, if, if if we look at the R5C or the cinema line, they will give us that oversampled in those other modes, but they don't do it in the stills hybrid cameras. A way of, for Canon to say, yeah, if you want that, go ahead and go to the cinema line or just record in the highest frame rate and then downsample. And you, you see, as a professional, that's not what we want to do. If we're out doing a shoot and we have a camera that's capable of doing oversampled 1080 or oversampled 2K, that is huge. That saves us an awful lot of time in post. We don't have to worry about these big, huge, heavy, four terabyte CF Express cards, which start at 17 or $1,800 for one of those four terabyte cards. So if you can shoot in 1080 and that's all you need to output and it's nice and detailed, well, that's what really matters. And that's what I'm kind of afraid of. I know Sony wouldn't do this. Sony provides oversample 1080. And I'm really hoping the R1 does provide oversample 1080. It makes an awful lot of sense. But what do you think? Where do you think the cripple hammer is going to strike on this camera? What do you think are the specifications for the Canon R1? All we know at this point is that it's due to be announced in the fourth quarter of this year, kind of like what Nikon did with the Z9. They announced that camera on October the 28th. And I could see Canon doing the same thing, but I'd start to see leaks maybe about five months ahead of any announcement. 
And then shipping, um, maybe they'll pull an icon and start shipping it just before Christmas with major sales starting up in January of 2023. I sense that this is going to be a huge camera. I don't know if it's going to be truly a master of everything, but I do sense it's going to offer video capabilities well in excess of the R5 and stills capabilities as well. So much so that I've already gone out and pre-ordered it from one of my local camera stores because I want to be first in line so that way I can get it as soon as it's out so I can let you guys know what I think of this camera because I have a sense that it is going to be really, really amazing. Already, look at the Nikon Z9 and what that camera is capable of. And I know, I just know, based on the way that Canon thinks, they're going to put out a camera better than the Nikon Z9, better than the Sony Alpha 1. But the question, the big question is, outside of that, what is it going to cost? Well, the 1DX Mark III is currently on sale and released for $64.99 US dollars. That's not cheap in any way at all. The Alpha 1 came out a year later at $64.99. And then in October, Nikon said, oh yeah, our Z9, yeah, it's uh, $54.99, $1,000 less. And I know that's going to have an impact on Canon's decision making. Canon and Nikon have been battling it out for decades. And actually, before Nikon or Canon was top of the hill, it was Nikon that was the number one camera company out there. And so I know that what Nikon has done with the Z9 is going to play with Canon. I know they're going to look at that price. They may not come in at $54.99. They may still come in at $64.99. But they're, whatever price they had initially planned, I think there's going to be some restraint in bringing that down a little lower. And yes, I understand the R3 at $59.99. And I still don't understand that camera. I understand the power of it, but... $59.99 for its capabilities compared to the competition, I think, is a little high. $59.99? More like $49.99. And the R1? Well, I think it'll probably come in around $64.99 plus inflation, so that would put it around $67 to $68.99. It's still a significant amount over the R3, but I think when the R1 comes out, that would put pressure on the R3 to go for less. It's really hard to say. I know Canon is bold enough that they could go even higher and go up to $74.99 because this is Canon after all. They are arrogant enough to know that they are the top camera market in the world. That is their belief. That is their mantra. And they're going to have a price that matches that. But what do you think that price is going to be? Let me know in the comments section down below. But that's it for now. Have yourself a great weekend and we'll see you again soon.